Listen, we are in week two this week in the Sermon on the Mount series. And last week we covered 16 verses. Like we covered a lot of information, right? Well, this week is only four verses. So everybody say, yay, it's only four. Pastor Jay is not going to go through all the Beatitudes again in one message. But these are four very important uh, verses for us. And, and as we get into this, as we cover this, I really want to just kind of set the stage for you uh, for what Jesus is going to share with us today. And part of when we do this, we always have to remember that there is an audience that Jesus is talking to. And this audience that Jesus is talking to in the Sermon on the Mount, it's comprised of regular people just like you and me, regular everyday people. I mean, like you think about your normal shipyard worker, your school teacher, like these were those kind of people. They were fishermen. They were, they were teachers. They cared for other people. They did those kinds of things. But then there were also some people there who were the religious elite, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, and they were listening to what Jesus had to say in that moment. So this crowd was comprised of all different types of people. And again, I want you to picture yourself there because part of our goal with this series is for you to really hear the words of Jesus as though Jesus himself were talking to you. And that's why it's so important for me as a teacher to make sure that I stick to God's word, that I stick to what he's actually saying to you is because these are actually Jesus' words uh, that we're going to dive into today. Now, one of the things that we have to ask in that scenario is this question. As Jesus is talking, what's the meaning of what Jesus is saying to the audience that he was talking to in that moment? What is he really communicating to them? And then when we hear what he's communicating to them, we can ask, what does that mean to, for our lives? See, oftentimes when we jump into Scripture, we like to just try to read it and make it apply to what, what we're doing today or what we see today. And you can't always just make that jump. Like, there's some steps in between. And that step in between is really, what did this mean to that original audience? And then how does that meaning apply to me? So that's what I want to do with you today. I want to ask those questions. What did this mean to that original audience? And how did that meaning apply to me? If you have your Bibles with you or your phones, you can go out and take out your phone, pull up your YouVersion app. We're going to be back in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be starting with verse 17 today. If you have your Bible, you can take that out and read along with it uh, as well. Again, we're just going to be doing four verses today, and they're going to require some unpacking and we're going to break this down. Now, as you're turning there, as you're pulling that up, let me say the object or the topic that Jesus is about to discuss is really what we consider the Old Testament in Scripture. Anybody ever read the Old Testament and thought to yourself, man, I have no clue what this means. Like, why are they out here? Why are they sacrificing all these animals? It maybe seems like God's a little bit angry, like he's just wiping people out. He's doing all this stuff. Like, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And that's part of what Jesus is going to address for us today, is this idea of what we call the Old Testament. So if you are there, let me hear you say, I'm there. Amen. All right, well, let's dive into this. Matthew 5, 17 says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. Jesus is talking to this crowd. And again, remember, this crowd is made up of people who had grown up in this religious society. This crowd is made up of people who have been taught by these Pharisees who were actually there in the crowd listening to this. And Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And that word abolish just means to get rid of, right? But what does Jesus mean by the law and the prophets? Well, the law is what the first five books of our Old Testament was really what they considered the law. In Hebrew, it was the Torah. It's Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Levit or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Genesis is all about the beginning. It lays out creation. It talks about the beginning. It talks about this covenant that God made with this man named Abraham that started the children of Israel. Exodus talks about how the children of Israel were enslaved and God frees them from this period of slavery. Leviticus goes into all these laws that discuss what it's like to live in the presence of of a holy God. And that's why it's important that we understand this is because God is really laying out like, these are the guidelines for you to live in my presence. And then you get into numbers where there's a count of the people and God retelling, these are the things that I've done for you. And then you get into Deuteronomy, which, is, which stands for second law, where God is again laying out, this is the law for you to live by as you go into this promised land. Now, in the midst of that, in the book of Exodus chapter 20, we read the Ten Commandments. And we have this law there, this Ten Commandments that we go through, and most of us are pretty familiar with them. The prophets is really all the other stuff in the Old Testament. And the prophets really lay out for us God's plan for redemption and how he's going to bring about his plan on the earth. 
And Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish all that stuff, but I came to fulfill it. I came to bring it to pass. And so here's the first takeaway I want you to get today, and it's this. Jesus confirms that the Old Testament is for us. And see, oftentimes we read the Old Testament and we think that that just applied to people a long, long time ago. But when Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish this, I came to fulfill it, what Jesus is really doing for you and me is saying that this is still for you. Now, does that mean that you're going to go out and sacrifice an animal today because you did something wrong? Is that what I'm saying to you right now? No, please don't, unless, like I shared with some people this morning, my brother Ben Rowe, who's not here right now, the church gave me a brisket for my birthday because they know me and they, they know they love me, right? And Ben turned it into a burnt offering yesterday, <laughs> pleasing and acceptable to the Lord, and it was delicious, and so I was very thankful for that. But unless you're going to do that, no, don't go sacrifice any animals, don't make any sacrifices or do anything like that, and we're going to talk about why that changed in a moment. But Jesus confirms that the Old Testament is for you and me. We don't have a right to just close this book and say, hey, this doesn't apply to me. We don't have a right to say, I'm just going to pick up in Matthew and read from there. Jesus says that this whole book is for you and for me. And so if we look at the next verse, verse 18, Jesus says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Wow, not one iota, not one dot will pass from the law. Well, that makes this kind of difficult, right? Because I just said to you, you don't need to go out and sacrifice any animals. Now, what does that really mean for us? Because if that's true in our minds, all of us who have tattoos are in trouble, right? All you ladies with earrings and then guys with earrings, we're in trouble, right? Like, what does that really mean for us? For Jesus to say that not one dot or iota is going to pass away. Well, let me give you some background on what's happening here. There's three parts to the law. There is what's known as the ceremonial law, which covers all of the stuff like the festivals, and this is how the temple operates, and this is when you can and can't come in and go out and all of that stuff. There's the judicial part of the law, and the judicial part of the law covers these are are, are the, the things you have to do to atone for sins. These are the things that transgress against God, and this is how you make those sins right in a sense. And then there is the moral part of the law, and that's like the Ten Commandments. This is how you live. This is how you treat other people. So y'all say that back to me. We got the ceremonial, we got judicial, and we got moral. So when Jesus is talking about the law to these people, he's talking about all three parts. And he says not one dot or iota is going to pass away until all is accomplished. So what does that mean for us? Well, Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection— fulfilled the ceremonial law. It was accomplished. He fulfilled it. And that's why you and I don't make sacrifices. That's why you and I don't have to travel to Jerusalem to worship. That's why you and I don't have to walk into a temple to be into the presence of God. As a matter of fact, under that law, we would not be able to. Only the high priest could go in. And even then, it was only one time a year. But you and I have access to the very throne room of God by the blood of Jesus. So Jesus, when he died and when he was buried and when he rose from the grave, he fulfilled the ceremonial part of the law. You and I are no longer bound by that. All right? And then Jesus, the judicial part of the law that talked about this is how you atone for sin. Jesus was born under the law. Jesus lived under the law. Jesus died sinless under the law. And Jesus rose from the grave victoriously over the law. So Jesus fulfilled the judicial part of the law. The law. The reason that you and I don't have to kill two turtle doves when we tell a lie or the reason we don't have to sacrifice a bull when we hurt one of our neighbors is because Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for you. There's no more blood that needs to be shed for your sin. When Jesus died on the cross in your place and his blood was poured out over you, what Jesus was really doing was fulfilling the judicial part of the law because, see, the righteousness of God demands that blood be shed for our sin. And in order for that sin to be atoned for, that's why they had all those sacrifices in the Old Testament. That's why they had to make all those offerings in the Old Testament. God's righteousness demanded it. But Jesus said, I'm going to step in in their place, and I'm going to be that perfect sacrifice. I'm going I'm to be born of a virgin, so I'm born without sin. I'm going to live a perfect life. I'm going to live according to the law. I'm not going to sin so that I can, use, I can be the propitiation or the substitute for their sacrifice. I'm going to be their sacrifice. And because Jesus did that for you and for me, we no longer have to sacrifice to atone for our sin. 
We're set free from the law in that way. So Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial part of the law, and Jesus fulfilled the judicial part of the law. And in Jesus' death, what he really did was he brought us out of, a co- out of the law that was established under an old covenant and brought us into a covenant of grace. So when Jesus said, until all is accomplished, he was talking about fulfilling those two parts of the law in our place. So what, is that, what part of the law does that leave for us? The moral law. This is how we live. This is how we treat other people. And that's where we get the, the uh, Ten Commandments. They fall into that whole moral law piece. So we know how that we're supposed to love our neighbor, that we're, we're supposed to love the Lord the God, our God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our strength, that we're supposed to love others as ourselves, that we should put no other God before our God, that we shouldn't murder, that we shouldn't steal, that we shouldn't covet our neighbor's wife. All of those things fall under the moral law. And you and I are still governed by that. The first takeaway, again, is that Jesus confirms that the Old Testament is for you and for me. The second takeaway is this. The Old Testament teaches us about the character and nature of God. And this is ultimately why the Old Testament is so important for us. And I won't say ultimately because there are some other reasons we're going to talk about in a minute. But this is one of the reasons why the Old Testament is so critical for you and for me. Remember earlier I said some of us read the Old Testament and we think to ourselves, man, God was angry. Like he was just killing people left and right. He's like, go in here, take over this land, wipe out all the people. Don't leave anybody. Don't leave a dog, a cat, a monkey. Don't leave anything. Like, and we're like, man, God was just angry. No, God is holy and God is righteous. And anything that's an affront to his holiness and righteousness needs to be taken out under this old law. And so I know that's hard for some of us to hear, but what we really have to understand is that when you read the Old Testament, you're learning something about the character and nature of God. And the thing that you're learning is this, that God's wrath is going to be poured out on sin, that there is going to be judgment that is poured out on sin, that nothing that is sinful will be able to stand before our holy God. And because you and I live under a covenant of grace, we don't always view things that way. And that's why we can go through life so flippantly and not care about the sin in our own lives because we don't understand God's holiness. We don't understand his righteousness. We don't understand his judgment. And yes, you and I live under grace. That's why we don't have to have fear about being consumed because of the sin in our lives. Because when God looks at you, he no longer sees you and he no longer sees your sin. What God actually sees is the blood of his son, Jesus, poured out over you. And so what God is actually seeing is the sacrifice that was made for your sin. Because again, all sin has to be atoned for. There's no way around that. And so since we're not out actually atoning for the sin ourselves, since we're not marching that cute little lamb down to the altar and slitting its throat and letting the blood come out and then burning it on the altar because we're not doing that, we don't always understand the gravity of our own sin. We don't understand the gravity of what that sin does. We don't understand the gravity of what that sin costs. And so we go through life and we live just kind of flippantly like, hey, man, it almost doesn't matter what I do because guess what? I'm under grace. All my sin has been atoned for. I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. You can't. Peter, Peter said in, in, in his letter uh, to the church, he said, God said, be holy for I am holy. There's an expectation on us as followers of Christ that we are conformed to the image of Christ, that we live lives that are holy like Christ lived. The good news for us is that we don't have to do that in our own power. We get to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we absolutely have a responsibility to live according to God's word. There's no way around that. And so I don't know what, what you're hearing in other places. I don't know what stuff you've encountered in your life. I don't know what people have told you that we need to accept this thing or accept that thing or that this thing is okay or that thing is okay. If God's word says it's not okay, it is not okay. Period, point blank. If God's word said it is not okay, it is not okay. We have a responsibility to live according to God's word. Because his word teaches us about his character and his nature. When you think about all the things the children of Israel had to do just to live in his presence, all those sacrifices they had to make, all those rules that they had to keep, it was all about living in the presence of a holy God. And we get to live with the presence of that holy God inside of us. Years ago, I wrote a book. It's not very good. That's why I don't talk about it often. But I I wrote a book. It's out there somewhere on Amazon. You can still find it and buy it, and I'll get like 38 cents if you do. But 
I wrote this book, and the book is about developing a relationship with God. And there's one chapter in that book that asks the question, does your temple match God's blueprint? See, in the Old Testament, God gave very specific instructions for how his temple was supposed to look, for how his temple was supposed to function. In the New Testament, we get very specific instructions for how we, the temple of God, are supposed to look and supposed to function. And so my question was, does your temple match his blueprint? And that's something I would challenge you with again, church, because I'm not saying that we have to be perfect. God doesn't expect our perfection. In fact, he knows he's not perfect. That's why he had to send his one and only son who was perfect to die in our place. But there is an expectation that we do all that we can to live according to his word. And he said, I will send you my Holy Spirit who will give you the power to do that. He will give you grace to do that. He will convict you when you sin. He will convict you when things go wrong in your life. And he will give you the faith and the grace that you need to get your life back in alignment with me. Because God is holy and he's righteous. And if we're going to dwell in his presence, we need to be holy because he is holy. And that word holy just means set apart. What it really means for you and for me is that we've chose to not be what the world says we should be. And we've chosen that we're going to be what God's word says that we should be. That's what it means to be set apart. Now, what that means for people in the world, let me tell you something. And this will set some of you free from the judgment and condemnation that you walk around heaping on other people. You cannot expect a person who does not have the Holy Spirit of God inside of them to live according to God's word. You just can't. And so when you're looking at people around you who are sinful, who are caught up in things, you and I sin each and every day, and we have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. How can we expect them to live according to his word when they don't? And so this, again, will set some of you free from the judgment that you cast on other people. Stop judging unbelievers. Stop judging nonbelievers according to God's word. Scripture tells us that the law itself is going to judge those people. Our job is not to judge them. Our job is to present the gospel to them. We take them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same gospel that set you free from the sin in your life. We take that to them, and we live a life according to God's word so that they can see that this thing is possible. They can see that by the power of the Holy Spirit, this is possible. And then they see Jesus in you, the love and the compassion, the same compassion that Jesus had that said it caused him to look at people as sheep without a shepherd. They were lost and hurting and harassed, and that's how Jesus saw them. We should see the whole world around us that way. We shouldn't look at them with judgment. We shouldn't look at them with hatred. We shouldn't look at them and be like, man, they're going straight to hell. <laughs> no, you were on your way there too. And Jesus saw fit to say, I'm going to pull you out of that. And we need to be trying to help as many people get pulled out of that as we possibly can. So we, can't, we need to live according to God's word. You can't expect a person without the Holy Spirit of God inside of them to do that. Does that make sense? So when you look at the world around you, look at them through the eyes of compassion. Look at them through the eyes of Jesus. But when you look at yourself, you need to judge yourself by this filter. Am I doing what this requires? That's why we're going to talk about this in a few weeks. That's why Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. For with the same measure that you judge other people, you yourself are also going to be judged. That's what he really means by that, is that at some point we're going to be judged for how well we follow this. But if we're constantly going around and judging and condemning other people, we're going to have that same lack of mercy poured back on us. And so I encourage you, church, be compassionate be loving, share the gospel. Don't, don't neglect God's word. We're going to stand firm on this. We believe this. We're not going to agree with things that go against this, but we're still going to love people. Does that make sense? Can we do that as a church? Can we say, this is what I believe and I am firm on this and the things that it says are wrong are wrong and the things that it says are right are right and you may not agree with me on that, but I'm going to love you anyway and I'm going to display the love of Jesus to you anyway. I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to judge you in that way. I'm just going to make sure that I stand up and do what I'm called to do, which is to be a witness. We're never called to be judges. Jesus said, I will send my Holy Spirit to you and he will give you power to be my witness. But he says it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin. It's not yours. You're not the Holy Spirit. we got to step out of that. And I know I'm way off topic. I haven't even looked at my notes in a minute. But I just want to make sure that we catch this because it's critical. If we're going to guide people to life in Christ, we have to make sure that our lives look like something that they see Jesus in so that they can see our lives and say, I want that. But then we also have to make sure we go to them with love and compassion. I don't know a single person that got saved because somebody told them you're going straight to hell right now. Not a single person. But I do know of people 
who have gotten saved because somebody said, you know what, I don't agree with your life, but I'm going to love you anyway. And I'm going to welcome you into my home. I'm going to feed you a meal. I'm going to spend time with you. And let me tell you, the reason I'm treating you this way is because I know this man named Jesus. And he redeemed me. He paid a price I could never pay. Let me introduce you to him. And then once you meet him, then he can take care of all the other stuff. I don't have to worry about that. All I have to do is be a witness the way that he called me to be a witness. So the second takeaway, the Old Testament teaches us about the character and nature of God. And so in that church, what you should really see is that our God is holy. Our God is holy. And the sins, the things that we do in life, and we talk about how sin separates, but truthfully for us as believers, nothing can separate us from the love of God. What sin really does in your life is it destroys your soul and it makes you live in hell on earth. You weren't designed to live in hell. You've been redeemed from that. And the sin in your life will destroy your soul and you will struggle with things, depression, anxiety, all types of other things. And I'm not saying that if you struggle with depression, it's because you're sinful. That's not what I mean. But what I am saying is that sin will introduce some of those things to your life. And that's what it does to us. It keeps us from being all that God has called us to be. We can never be fully conformed to the image of Christ if we are willingly living in sin in our lives because he is holy and he's called us to be holy because he's holy. The third takeaway for us from what Jesus said here is that we have a responsibility to teach others. If we look back at Matthew 5, 19 through 20, he said, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on in verse 20 to say, for I tell you, unless the righteousness, your righteousness, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus talking about here? What's he talking about in this moment? He's really talking about the difference between religion and relationship. He's saying that if these, these scribes and Pharisees, they were super religious. So they were the people who said, I'm going to keep all the rules. I'm going to do all the things that are laid out in the book of Leviticus. And I'm going to keep them in such a way that you look at my life and you're impressed by me because I did these things. And what they were really trying to do is they were trying to earn favor with God with how, by how well they kept rules. Jesus is like, Unless your righteousness exceeds even theirs, and they were good at it, you're never going to see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, again, is pointing out how incapable we are as people of doing all of this stuff. But again, we should be encouraged by the fact that Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us to help us do those things. So that we can do those things because he has given us us, his power to do that. But he's saying that we have a responsibility to teach other people. One of the last things Jesus said to his disciples is found in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. is what we call the Great Commission, where he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, all that I've commanded you. Now, when Jesus was commanding them, he didn't have the letters that we consider the New Testament. He didn't have the Gospels. He didn't have all the letters that Paul wrote. Those came 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. He didn't have all the letters that John wrote, that Peter wrote. He didn't have any of that. What was he teaching them? The Old Testament. Because, again, he confirms that the Old Testament is for us. And, again, he teaches us that the Old Testament teaches us about the character and nature of God. So when Jesus was saying, teach them to obey all that I've commanded, he was pulling those commands from the Old Testament. That's why we can't ignore it. And part of what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to see this after this week, is Jesus basically rewrites what they know about all those commandments. I mean, he talks about things like lust and adultery and divorce and how you spend your money and greed and pride and all this stuff that they had turned into these hard, fast, legalistic rules. And Jesus says, you've missed the spirit of the whole thing. Like, you've totally missed it. Yeah, you're following a rule, but your heart's not right. And so Jesus uses the Sermon on the Mount to really teach us it's not necessarily how good you are at following rules. It's really about the condition of your heart. But he says that we need to teach all that he commanded. There's a verse that back in, at, a, at a former job when I had my own office, I don't have my own office, now I have to share it with Pastor Brian. Y'all pray for me. But <laughs> we're very different workers. He's hyper and energetic and I'm usually quiet. Although he listens to like soft jazz when he works, which is really weird because if you know Pastor Brian, you know he's like super energetic. I don't know why I just shared that with y'all. He's probably going to fight me for that. I love you, brother. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, anyway, but there's a verse that I used to have on the whiteboard in my office, and it's Ezra 7.10, and it says this, For Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it 
and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And the reason I had that on, on, my off, on the wall in my office was because I always wanted to be reminded that as a pastor, my job is to study God's word and to do it and to teach it. And I really love the order that Ezra put that in. Like, I need to study it first. I need to spend time in his word because me studying his word is what teaches me his commandments. It's what teaches me what I need to teach. But before I get to a place where I can stand up here and teach you, I need to first be doing it. Right? You remember that? Practice what I preach, right? And if a preacher can't say that, then there's a problem. And so, but here's the thing, and you may be thinking like, Pastor Jay, yeah, you need that in your office, you're a preacher. No, we need this in our homes. Parents, you need to study God's word, and you need to do it, and you need to teach your children. If you really want your children to grow up understanding God's word, they're not going to grow up understanding God's word by you bringing them here and putting them in city kids on a Sunday morning if you're not also teaching, studying his word and doing it and teaching it in your home. That's your responsibility. It's not my job to teach your children about Jesus. It's my job to partner with you as you teach your child about Jesus. It's not city kids' job to teach your kid about Jesus. It's their job to partner with you as you teach your child about Jesus. So my question for us is, are we studying God's word for ourselves? And are we doing it? And then are we teaching it? Because let me tell you something. Kids pick up on hypocrisy really quick really quick, and your child will call you out if you start coming to them and being like, hey, bro, hey, Leviticus chapter 13, verse 14 says, thou shalt not wear eyeshadow before you turn 14, right? It doesn't say that, but if it did, and you go to your child and you say that, and they're going to be like, well, <laughs> Proverbs also says that you shouldn't be drunk, but I've seen you drunk four times this week, and then, then what? I'm getting in somebody's business now, my bad. But seriously, your kids will call you out. And so if you're not studying God's word so that you know it, and if you're not doing it in your life, if you're not applying it, you probably don't really have the right to teach them yet. So you need to make sure that you're studying it and you're doing it, and then you can teach them. But it is your responsibility to teach them. The quiet, the silence. I know, guys, I get it. I'm a parent. I struggle with that, too. I totally get it. And I'm really saying this more as an encouragement because God has actually, I think, laid out a blueprint for us in this. Study my word. And you don't, I tell people all the time, because, you know, sometimes we get wrapped up in these Bible reading plans, and I'm going to read the whole Bible in three months, and I'm like, okay, I mean, if that's what you really feel you need to do right now, okay, but this was really written for you to, to digest over a lifetime. And the way we're meant to study God's word is to read it in a way to understand it. And I've been, I've been in college. I spent a lot of time in college. I know what it's like to study just enough to pass a test. And I feel like sometimes we study God's word that way. Like, we're not really trying to learn it. We're just trying to get enough information so we can pass this one little test, and then we move on to the next thing. This is meant for you to digest over your lifetime. So you have to spend time in it. You have to meditate on it. And I encourage people all the time, they're like, how much should I read in a day? Scripture doesn't give us a formula for that. If, if, if you pick up your Bible and you read two verses and the Holy Spirit says, I need you to think on this, stop after two verses. Think on it. Meditate on it. Digest it. Get it in your heart. The, the God told the children of Israel, write my words on the tablet of your heart. He didn't say just memorize a few of them. He wants them written. He wants them to become who we are. That's what that means. And the only way that that really happens is if you really get in his word and study it and get to know him. But we got to study his word, and then we got to do it. You got to live it out. And I know that's hard, but the truth is we don't have to live it out in our own power. We get to live it out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we can teach it. So the third takeaway was we have a responsibility to teach others. And then the fourth takeaway is this, and this is actually probably the most important one. The law shows us our need for a Savior. And the prophets tell of God's plan to save us. The Apostle Paul, the reason Romans 7 and 8 are up there is because the Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans in chapter 7 and 8. And I'm looking forward to doing a series one day just kind of going through the whole book of Romans uh, word by word. But it's, it's a lot in there. It's complicated. Even the Apostle Peter said our brother Paul writes in ways that are hard to understand. So if Peter couldn't understand it, then we'll, we'll get there eventually, right? Um, but... Paul talks about this, and if you, start, if you read that, when you first read Romans 7, you're actually going to think that Paul is bashing the law, but he's not. 
He's really laying out, hey, like, we had this law, and it was all these rules, but it was never going to save us. It was inadequate to save us, right? He's not saying the law was bad, because he actually says, and the reason it's here is, is he makes this statement. He said, I would have never known sin if not for the law, for I would have never known what it meant to covet or covetousness if the law did not say thou shalt not covet. He was really saying that the law really taught him what things upset God. The law really showed him these are the things that God does not like. And he would not have known in his life what God didn't like if not for the law. But he says the law was never going to save us. It was never capable of doing that. And so God gave us this law as a way for us to be or a way for the children of Israel to be in relationship with him, to be in his presence. But it was never going to save them. It was never going to save them. It was always temporary, right? It was a temporary substitute. And then when, when Paul goes into Romans 8, that's when he gets into, like, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was in, incapable of doing, he points it out again, the law was incapable of saving us. He says that Jesus Christ did for us. And so there's this understanding that God gave us this law. And Jesus said these law and the the prophets came because he said, I'm not coming to abolish it. I'm coming to fulfill it. God gave it for a purpose. It was to teach you about his character, about our character. It was to teach you how to be in relationship with us. It was to show you the holiness and righteousness and judgment of God. And ultimately to show you, you could never do this on your own. You need a savior. You need a savior. You need a savior. We all need a savior. And then the prophets tell, God says, this is my plan to save you. If you read through the Old Testament, you see right away in the book of Genesis, in chapter three, the fall of man, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, right? They were in the garden. God said, you can eat of any tree, any fruit of any tree in this garden. Just don't eat from that one. And what they do like people, (laughs) I'm going to that tree because that fruit looked good. And we blame Eve, but the Bible actually says that Adam was the one who sinned. And it's because Adam was the one that God gave the command to. And Adam was the one who was disobedient. Eve was deceived, but Adam was disobedient. All right? And so so God, from that moment, God said, I'm going to make a covering for you, and I'm going to make a way for you to be redeemed. And then he goes through talking to them about all the things that are going to happen because of their sin. But then he says to Eve about her seed, that he's going to send a seed through her that will eventually redeem us. It's the first promise of Jesus. It's right there in Genesis chapter 3. And then God, we read on in Genesis as God identifies this family through this man named Abraham that he's going to use to send about this seed. And then we keep reading about this family, how God makes provision through a man that was sold into slavery by his brothers because God knew a famine was going to come. And God established him in a foreign land, brought him from a slave into the palace and established him in a foreign land so that he could make provision that God was going to preserve this family through that thing that seemed like a bad situation. But then we get into Exodus and we read that they've now been in slavery 400 years. And the end of Exodus chapter 2, it just says that God heard or God saw and he knew. He saw his children being oppressed and he knew. So God comes to Moses in Exodus 3 at the burning bush and he says, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And so then we read in Exodus the story of God delivering his people out of Egypt. And then we read in Leviticus where God says, all right, now you're in my presence. Here we are. Here's how you live in my presence. Here's how you can be around me. Here's how I can dwell with you. And then we read on throughout the Old Testament, and we see time and time again how God made provision for his people, how he delivered his people, how he rescued his people. What we really see in all of those stories was that throughout the history of God's plan, there was always a need for a Savior, and God always sent a type of that Savior. But then we get to the New Testament, and we start reading in the Gospels, and we see that God sent Jesus to be that Savior, you and I all need a Savior. We need a Savior because just like the children of Israel, we were in slavery. We were in bondage to sin, and we were never going to be able to set ourselves free. But God sent Jesus, and he paid the price on the cross so that now you and I can live totally free from the bondage of sin, but we needed a Savior. He paid a debt we could never pay because we needed a Savior. He died in your place because even if you died on that cross, you would have died in your sin and your death would have been worthless. But because Jesus lived perfect when he died in your place, he became your savior. And he ultimately became your savior when he rose victoriously from that grave three days later. That's when he said, I have taken the keys to death, hell, and the grave. I am the savior because we all need a savior. 
but we read throughout Scripture how God identified early on, these people need a Savior, and I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to send my son Jesus to die in their place. He's going to be the ultimate sacrifice for their sin. And after he fulfills that part of the law, there will never be a need for another sacrifice. There will never be a need for people to have to go through the high priest to get to me. As a matter of fact, this is that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two, signifying that you and I now have access to the Father through the blood of Jesus. We can go boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy to help in a time of need, but we needed a Savior to get that. See, what ultimately happened in the garden with Adam and Eve was that we were separated from God. That relationship was destroyed. We were removed from being in harmony with God. But what God did through allowing Jesus to die on the cross in your place was he made a way for that relationship to be reestablished. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus. One of my favorite verses in the story of Adam and Eve is actually after Adam and Eve sinned because it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the reason I love that verse so much is because I think it actually gives us an indication of what that relationship was like beforehand. They knew what it sounded like for God to walk in the garden. And you and I can have that knowledge, that understanding of what it's like to walk with God through the sacrifice that Jesus made for you because we all need a Savior. And the the Old Testament shows us, the law shows us our need for a Savior. And the prophets lay out God's plan to save us. And so we have four takeaways today. And I I hope that that you guys are able to write those down, to think about them, to meditate them on throughout the week. Uh, We have some personal reflection questions uh, for you as well to think on throughout the week. And it's just this, Do I view the Old Testament with the proper perspective? Am I looking at it through the right lens? Or have I been living under this idea that the Old Testament is just not for me? And I know we've all grown up, or those of us who grew up in church grew up with the whole, hey, I'm under grace, I'm not under the law anymore. And I think Jesus would say that, yes, you are under grace, but it's not true that you're not under the law anymore. I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. The law has been fulfilled in me. So you're still under it. It's just been paid for. And because of that, you are under grace. And then that question from from the book, and no, I'm not self-promoting, but because, again, the book's not very good, but does my temple match God's blueprint for my life? Does it match? Am I living according to his will and word, or am I living according to my own will? And this is where it's important to study God's word, to study it and to do it. And then we can teach it because we have a responsibility to teach others. But this always starts with that fourth takeaway, understanding that we all need a Savior and that God made a plan for us to be saved. And then there are some themes for the week for our church.